You know when a police chief really feels his power? When he hires and fires people? When he throws folks in jail? When he's bossing everyone around all morning? No, there's no power there. Just bureaucratic red tape. Like directing traffic. Not that it's all bad. No, I feel it the most when people come to me with accusations. Accusations happen outside the law. They don't need to be rational or supported by evidence. They don't petition justice in the careful words of legal formality. No, an accusation is a personal cry, full of resentment or envy, a defeated moan or an angry howl. The accuser rarely imagines you'll share their resentment, their envy, their hatred. No, but they do imagine that your love of power is so strong that you'll leap to decide the fates of others, happy just to take someone's word for the facts. Businessmen accuse the gangsters, the gangsters blame our public figures, public figures denounce politicians, the politicians point to the businessmen. When it comes to accusation, there's only one rule. Don't aim too high. If you overestimate your own importance, then complaining can cost you your life. So choose the easier path. Exaggerate as far as you can, and try to make your plea sound as sad and pathetic as possible. The accusation I received today sure didn't fit the normal mold. After killing Vickis Varga and routing his supporters, Sand further strengthened his already powerful authority. Even a month ago, anyone coming out against Sand would sound like a lunatic with a death wish. Today, it's the same thing as suicide. But the letter I'm holding in my hands directly connects Henry Sand, lieutenant of the Sand Mafia family, to the reported death of successful banker John Pazzi. Henry has a daughter, Marianne, a dancer, and apparently it all started with her. One day, Marianne danced in the title role of a production of Giselle, and Henry, proud father that he is, brought the whole family to the premiere, along with some of the family's business partners. Among their guests was the young banker John Pozzi. He couldn't keep his eyes off Marianne, but she ended up brushing him off. In response, Pozzi ambushed her one night after rehearsal, pulled her into his limousine, and had his way with the poor girl. After that, gentleman that he was, he drove the girl home and threatened that if she told anyone what happened, her mother would get the same treatment. But her father still managed to shake the truth out of Marianne, and he decided to take his revenge. Of course, Henry knew he couldn't just go with his instincts and put a bullet in Potsy in broad daylight. The rich bastard was too important for business, and Henry is neck deep in the family business overseeing transportations for the San Mafia. He knew about every delivery delay, every car, and every shop. It was mostly thanks to Henry that the whole sand operation rolls so smoothly. Henry has free access to all their off-book cars, and a tar-black motive. Yeah, he could easily arrange the death of John Pozzi as a drunken, late-night hit-and-run. But Henry Sand is smarter than that. If this story about Potsy is true, he'd more likely go to the boss and ask permission. I'd have figured this letter the ramblings of a retired gangster looking to spice up his life with little excitement. The way the letter started, my dear little old cop cake, I had every mind to toss it in the trash. But something else got my attention. They're rarely ever signed. But this one ended, Robes Pierre and I doubt it's an imposter. No one would go against the most powerful group in the city, hoping to hide behind the name of some prankster clown. Like everyone else, I had no idea who Robespierre was or what he wanted. But there was no doubt that this guy was more than a little crazy. An arrogant psychopath. Could be dangerous. Definitely worth looking into.
Officer on scene. Looks like we have a situation here. I 
Oh, Jack, you always come back so late. What's wrong? Bad news? Good news, Jack. Laura is ready. Ready how? She's coming back? When? Not that fast, Jack. Laura's ready to talk. But if she's ready to talk, she's getting ready to come back. You just need to find the right words. Y you can find the right words, right, Jack? I'm not an idiot. I didn't ask for this, Jack. It's the middle of the night, and I'm alone on an old farm, 40 minutes away from anywhere, sat on a creaky porch, and now I'm getting snapped at. I came here so you could personally promise me that you'll be able to find the right words. So let's try again. You can find the right words, right, Jack? I can find the right words, Mrs. Markham. That's good to hear. Tomorrow night at 3 o'clock at the Octopus Restaurant. You know it? Yeah, but it's closed at night. Oh, I've arranged for them to be open. Don't be late. But don't come too early, either. Mrs. Markham? Yeah? I should probably offer you some tea or something before you go. <laughs> Do you have any tea? No. Good night, Jeb.
progress. According to Mrs. Markham, I was supposed to spend all day thinking up the right words. But to my surprise, I did my best work when I shut my head off. I didn't even want to think why Laura decided we'd meet at 3 o'clock in the morning, and in a restaurant we'd never gone to. I didn't know what to tell her, and something tells me she's no more ready for this meeting than I am. By nightfall, I finally stopped worrying. The right words would come when they were needed. And if they don't come at all, then so be it. I've heard said, when you're knocked out by a single blow, you don't have time to feel any pain. Well, that's a lie. It's painful as hell. Every day I spent in that coma, the pain was unbearable. <laughs> 